Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Lennon M., Jackie A., Paul M., and Nick W. Returning to the show today, Dan Earl has joined us. Dan is president and CEO of Solaris Resources, a exploration and development stage company focused on copper gold projects throughout Central and South America, including the flagship Warenza Copper Project in Ecuador. Solaris is part of the Agresta Group. The company is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol SLS and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol SLSSF. Dan, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, Dan, what's the latest on the copper market and what is your expectation on where the price is headed over the next few years? Great place to start. We've seen a big move in copper up off the bottom. Uh, I view this basically as the first leg of a structural bull market. Um, so we've seen the the price double uh, off the lows that were set in the March, you know, kind of pandemic crisis lows around two dollars a pound or so. But you've got to keep the big picture in mind, and I think the prior cycles provide that perspective for you. And so what we saw in the mid 2000 cycle and then again in the post financial crisis cycle is that the copper price actually quadrupled over two to three years time so we've only just doubled now and i think everyone agrees that this cycle is going to be even more powerful than those prior cycles with the overlay of greater fiscal stimulus particularly oriented towards infrastructure and then the green revolution so this is electrification of transport electrification of industry and decarbonization that we're going to have this cycle. So I think there's a very long way to go in terms of this copper cycle. There is a lot of interesting setups here that we have, a lot of tailwinds that aren't necessarily normal either. And if uh, things continue to progress in places like the states, infrastructure package is forthcoming and most likely is going to get passed in a big way. A lot of running hot printing presses here which is good for copper and of course the EV uh, setup that we have before us as well. Do you think the prices will move fairly fast here? You alluded to the quadruple uh, last time. Do you think they'll move fairly fast or do you think that this copper price run, Dan, lasts through mid late decade? I think this is a multi-decade structural bull market that we have here. The, the important thing to understand is that copper is absolutely foundational and indispensable to the green revolution and electrification megatrends uh, that are now getting underway and intensifying out into the future. We haven't even hit the stride of those trends yet. Whereas with other battery metals, and I think this is where investors get confused, there are idiosyncratic factors that apply to a greater extent in those smaller, uh, ne more niche uh, markets. And they're more subject to you know, technical change that can lead to you know, demand destruction, substitution, and so on. So you would have seen, for example, an another one of the metals, which is actually touted as a greater beneficiary of uh, this electrification megatrend was, was nickel. But you would have seen recently that Xinxian Group out of China, which is the world's largest stainless steel manufacturer, is now basically announcing that they've got a, a technique to take uh, nickel pig iron products and then convert them over, which are, you know, which which had basically capped the prior nickel cycle um, by supplying into stainless steel manufacturing that nickel pig iron product. They've now they've now now come up with a solution to take that product and then process it further into sulfate to start feeding into uh, the battery nickel market. And so that's a that's a uh, you know just really a dramatic change, and we've seen you know nickel prices react immediately to that losing over 15 percent off the the spot quote um as a result of 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 that announcement and that was a metal for which even greater demand growth was relative to the market was expected 
uh, with this electrification megatrend. And, that, and that's, why I, that's why I emphasize with copper that it's absolutely foundational and indispensable. It's, it's the one metal with scale in terms of the market, which investors absolutely must be exposed to, to play these evolving megatrends. I think it's a generational trade that we have here in copper. That's my long-term view. That's, that's really a multi-decade view. There are, I mean, depending on which time scale you look at, there are different factors to discuss and we could spend all day talking about copper. In the very short term, obviously you've got, um, you know, technical factors at play. You've got a uh, short term uh, supply disruptions at play, particularly, you know, the main copper producing regions of, of Chile and Peru together accounting for about a third of the world's copper supply. You've got short-term supply disruptions in those markets, which are, are feeding into the market. And then of course, you've got on the flip side, you know, these short-term, the demand burst uh, coming out of China, you know, which emerged from the COVID pandemic quickly and cleanly um, and, and delivered, you know, positive growth last year, the only major economic region to deliver positive growth. So you've got, you know, you've got these short-term factors over the midterm. Um, I think what we're going to see is, is the copper supply really peak out. And then this is with the, the mega mines of the industry. So the top 10 mines in the, in the, in the copper industry supply about a quarter of the, of the output. And these mines are up against the constraints of now depletion on the reserve side, uh, grade declines, water constraints, other constraints. And we're going to start to see those mines roll off, and that's when things really get interesting for the cop for 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 the copper market is when you're transitioning from that midterm out into the longer term, where new sources of supply are going to have to come in at the same time as this these demand trends are really taking off. Yeah, there's a lot of parts and pieces to that, and the development side is also constrained with just the social license and permitting timelines and nobody wants a mine in their backyard type setup. So you've got a lot of great tailwinds here. And Yeah, uh, well, that, it, that, that's actually a, a, a critical point. And, and it's worth just pausing there and just exploring that in a bit more detail because it's different than the prior cycles. So in the prior cycles, you know, people talk in general about commodities, you know, the cure for high prices are high prices, you know, i.e. it brings out additional supply. But that's going to be different. That's going to be constrained, and that's going to lag in this cycle to a greater degree than it than it has in prior cycles for the very reasons that you just talked about. The the lead times for projects, as a as a function of a whole variety of issues, but particularly the regulatory issues and the CSR and ESG and social license, all those uh, intertwined issues, are are uh, are, are non are non-economic reasons why these projects are going to take a lot longer uh, to bring to market. So we're going to see a, a delayed price response or a delayed supply response to price uh, this cycle. And that's before yep. you even get into considering how empty the pipeline is, you know, the dearth of, uh, of capital spending, which has led to that, and the dearth of expiration spending, which means that the expiration projects in behind aren't there either. It's going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out. Yeah, wouldn't be surprised to see double-digit copper. It only starts at 10, so we'll see what happens. Well, besides copper here, right, you touched on nickel, Dan, but any other particular segments of the natural resource markets that you like for a base supply-demand case? It's hard to beat the dynamics that you have in copper because it because in copper, it's not just the, the normal sort of cyclical play that we have in front of us. It's it's that cyclical play, but then we've got these factors on top of it that really set up that special, I think, generational opportunity in copper. And it's hard to see that in other commodities. But no, it's look, I think copper really stands alone from my perspective. I think that that's the, that's the market with scale with just this unique set of circumstances bringing about a generational opportunity for me. Yeah, I think there's two, and copper is one of them for me. The other one's uranium. But uh, for another conversation, Dan, yep. let's move on. Let's talk Ecuador for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, lots of predictions and criticisms out there on this election. Who wins? And does Ecuador remain a key place to be during this early and mid stages of this cycle going forward? Yeah. In Ecuador, you got to start at the top uh, because I think that basically the framework for you know countries' guides policy 
whatever the the politics and you know and regime that is in power it's it's really the framework that exists that is going to be the true guide of the direction the country takes and, and with ecuador you've got a dollarized economy so this is about a hundred billion dollar a year economy it's in us dollars is overwhelming support like something like 97 percent polling support for the dollar uh, based system in Ecuador. That's not going anywhere. That's that's not really uh, subject to to change. So you've got a hundred billion dollar economy. How do you fund this economy? Well, you've got to fund it in dollars, obviously. So there's three basically three ways you can fund an economy. There's um, exports in dollars. For in the case of of Ecuador, this would be largely oil exports. Up until just the last year, we've had two mines come online and started diversifying the export mix and then obviously agricultural products and other things um, you've got debt issuance in in dollars um, and for ecuador they're 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 more than tapped out in terms of issuing debt so they're actually in the midst even prior to the pandemic were uh, entering into a sovereign debt crisis so they racked up something like 60 65 billion dollars of sovereign debt and they're in the process of restructuring that and then there's, um, of course, foreign foreign direct investment. And so in response to the need uh, coming out of the last oil price crash in 2014, uh, the Korea government at the time um, decided that they needed to diversify the economy. And the way to do this, the obvious way to do this, given the potential, the mineral rich potential of the country was to uh, open up the mining sector. And so they, they basically implemented a basket of uh, policies that were supportive and encouraged the growth of the sector. So these were things like eliminating the windfall mining tax, reducing royalty rates, um, um, introducing VAT rebates. You know, there's no indigenous economy, mining economy in Ecuador, producing equipment and consumables and so on. So everything's important. VAT rebates are critically important as a result. And then a swath of regulatory reforms, allowing for investor protection agreements um, and other things, shortening the permitting timeline and so on. So that was the policy, um, uh, basically prescription from the Korea government to encourage the growth of the mining sector. That has worked. We just, so th that was implemented, you know, beginning in 2014. And just last year, we saw the first two commercial mines go into production, uh, metal mines in, in Ecuador. So these were, you know, Fruta del Norte, and then, uh, which is a gold mine, and then uh, Mirador, which is a copper mine, uh, both of them in southeastern Ecuador. And so the result on the economy has been um, something like uh, uh, $800 million or a little bit more than $800 million in exports, over $400 million in tax revenue uh, into the government straight to the bottom line, and a similar amount of foreign direct investment. And this is only the first two mines that have come on, of which there are going to be many more out into the into the future. And critical to this is going to be the social and environmental performance of the industry. This is what's required to uh, continue to show that policy in a positive light to the public and continue to maintain the strong support uh, for that policy going forward. And so that's something that Lundin Gold has been a great leader on in respect to bringing the Fruit del Norte project on in a socially inclusive and environmentally responsible fashion and really winning over a lot of support, showing how the mining industry can do this. Um, and that's something that we're, you know, uh, picking up from them and, and taking this forward now in the context of, you know, the indigenous population in the country uh, with our project and our unique, innovative uh, Modelo Marinsa, the strategic alliance that we have for our indigenous partners. So that's uh, basically the framework. The election, we, we just came out of the first round of the election, uh, which has set the runoff to determine the president. So the parliament is already set, and then the president will be determined out of the runoff election, which will take place in April. And, and what we have is, is basically, um, on the one hand, Andreas Arauz, who's a Correista. So he was a candidate selected by Rafael Correa, the former president who opened up the mining sector. You can imagine his policies are consistent with, with promoting the growth of the mining sector on the one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, we have Guillermo Lasso, who's a conservative 
a traditional conservative the way that you would understand that with um you know a platform of uh, of privatization and and deregulation and uh you know incentivizing the growth of the private sector so both of these candidates explicitly pro mining so it's a pro mining versus pro mining uh runoff um they've ruled out any possible uh coalition both candidates have ruled out any possible coalition that could involve an anti-mining anti uh, capitalist element. And so as far as it, it, it being a risk event, the risk is basically behind us now at, at this stage. And so we're into, you know, from the mining sector's perspective, we've, we've basically uh, secured the next uh, four years of our future in Ecuador as being a great place to do business. Yeah, I think it would be highly destructive if they don't continue with their natural resource development in the mining sector and also the oil business. Uh, oil less and less as time goes on, as we know, but there is a supply issue there. Notwithstanding that, the mining side is important because I don't see how the finances in Ecuador pencil out without those two businesses. If you look at you know, a country like Nicaragua, um, I believe gold overtook as the largest export. So it's important for these countries, mineral development. And I think Ecuador's done a good job by taking a smarter currency, the US dollar, much like Panama has. And I think that's also been a very smart move long term, even though we know the dollar is ugly, but it's still more or less the prettiest girl in the room, if you will. And I think it's really important for Ecuador to continue what they're doing here. And it looks like both candidates are plenty mm. acceptable here. Well, let's talk yeah. uh, Solaris. Why don't you give us just a quick update, Dan, on the current capital structure, the shares outstanding now, cash and major uh, holders? Absolutely. So, so we completed a financing on the last day of the year last year, and that brought our uh, cash balance to over $90 million. This is Canadian dollars um, at the end of the year. And then we've got a further $90 million of in the money um, potential warrant proceeds. So these are war warrants that are in the money, further $90 million of potential proceeds there. And these are largely held by management and our strategic supporters. So this is not an overhang on the stock. These are held by ourselves. It's a source of funding if and when we, we need it, although we don't anticipate that we will need that cash. Uh, in, in terms of the, the ownership, this is a, a management owns uh, a, a great deal of this company. Um, so you're talking about over 30% of our shares outstanding are held by management, by the executive team here. Most significantly, Richard Wark, our executive chairman. But then even beyond that, our strategic supporters are major owners of this company. Uh, so Equinox Gold would be sitting at uh, about 27%. The Lundin family would be sitting at about 5%. And then Ross Beattie and, 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 and David Lowell's estate would, would also be significant holders. So if you put it all together, you're looking at a tight share structure with something like close to 70% of the shares outstanding held by either uh, management or our strategic supporters. And those shares aren't going anywhere. They're not being sold into the market. I think everyone's um, unified in a view that this is going to be a multi-billion dollar portfolio and that um, all we need to do is, 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 is go out and execute on our strategy to deliver on that kind of a return. That's great. And you guys are delivering on that. And certainly it's shaping up to be exactly what you have stated here as we move on here. And this is still early stage. Uh, you just completed an uplisting to the TSX. Any further listing plans anticipated over, say, the next year or two? It's possible. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question. It is possible that we could upgrade our U.S. listing. Um, so possibly list on, on, you know, I mean, this, and this is something in the discussion stage. I don't want to be clear that I'm not promising anything, but, um, but, but we are cer certainly looking at upgrading our U.S. listing to just reach a broader audience of our, our investors and facilitate easier trading for existing uh, shareholders in, in the U.S. So, so that would be the one, that would be the one part of our, uh, of our, of our listing that, uh, that we could look at upgrading into the future certainly a good step there and makes sense as you guys uh well it already makes sense for you guys given the market cap but definitely yeah. something that you could look at doing and the cream of the crop there are the final listings probably and you know off to the races from there but uh maybe let's talk 
a little bit of local community, Dan. Um, any yeah. latest developments that you want to update on the community relations uh, locally? Uh, any particular projects you want to point out that you guys are working on, and, and how is that social license coming? Well, the, the work in, in terms of the the social license, you know, so so basically we we have we announced last year the signing of an impact and benefits agreement with the uh, traditional owners. So this is the project resides on the ancestral lands of two Shuar nations, which are the Shuar nation of Warrens and the Shuar nation of Yawi. And they have a, a, lead, a joint leadership council that's democratically elected. They have uh, term limits in place. It's, it's quite an elegant uh, leadership structure that they have. And that leadership structure entered into this impact and benefits agreement. And so that provides the uh, certainty of community support for the project over its full life cycle. So from the exploration stage, which it's in currently, and then into development, the next stage, uh, you know, construction, production, and then all the way uh, through to, to closure. Um, so the certainty of community support and then the terms of that support. So what we're, you know, laying out the impacts on the one hand and then the benefits that we're going to provide on the other hand. And we're, and we're very proud of the, 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 the job that we've done. We've got uh, 229 employees uh, currently, 184 of those employees are indigenous employees from these communities largely, but then also some from the neighboring uh, indigenous communities. And that's with six drill rigs currently. Um, we've laid out a strategy of, of ramping up our drilling program to 12 rigs around about the middle of the year. And so our headcount in terms of employment uh, will grow from uh, roughly the 230 level to 450 employees. And we've already reached essentially full employment within the communities that are subject to our impact and benefits agreement. So, so they have a population of about 500. And then uh, the employment that we have from those communities, essentially it's full employment. Everyone who wants a job on the project has a job. And the people that don't have jobs with the project, they're, they're likely involved in uh, other business activities, some of which we've you know, fostered the creation with our business Kickstarter program and created capacity for in the communities, then they're working, you know, they're indirectly participating in the economic activity of the, of the project. So, so that's essentially maxed out and the growth in the employment is gonna be uh, coming from these neighbor, largely from these neighboring indigenous communities. And so we're, we're in discussions with um, uh, about a dozen additional uh, indigenous communities around the project, which are, interested in in contributing uh employees to the project and so we've got you know training project programs that are in discussion and uh and then the same formula of 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 direct employment and then for the people who don't want to directly work on the project um kick-starting business opportunities um so that they can participate in the economic uh development uh that's ongoing with this project uh indirectly through their own you know separate uh, business ventures so that's basically the, the CSR effort. We've got a concrete social license for the project with the, the registered owners of the project um, who have you know, autonomy and the rights to self-determination on their lands. That's enshrined in the Ecuadorian uh, constitution. Um, and then it's about growing, so, so networking out um, the positive impact that this project is having and winning over uh, you know, larger and larger swaths of the uh, territory uh, around the project. And that that right there is how uh, exploration stage projects in the mining sector have a positive impact, okay? So it's through employment, it's through skills training. Uh, this is in a region, obviously, where it's largely subsistence existence of, you know, hunting and farming and so on. So providing those well-paid jobs providing skills training, worker training, safety training, um, providing direct community development. So putting in community infrastructure, like for example, we these communities were remote communities. We connected them up now to the, in a joint project with the local municipality, we've connected them up to the highway network so they can access the rest of uh, Ecuador and the opportunities that that entails. Um, so building community infrastructure like that uh, community buildings, um, you know, which can double as educational facilities, putting in uh, health facilities so that we can start delivering medical care into these communities. 
this is how mining does positive benefits into remote communities. This is how it's done in the exploration stage, and we're proud of it. Yeah, that sounds great, Dan. And as you guys continue to progress and get larger, uh, you know, there's other projects at communities like sanitation projects, water, uh, maybe some oh, power, okay. internet, um, you know, these types of things. So, no, I think it's great. This is excellent. And uh, you guys are just starting out here and you're taking it in stages as this project grows, which looks like it has a lot of runway. So good on you guys for those efforts. And this is really key for the area. And it's so important, the mining sector for these regions and certainly for the country. Well, you mentioned drill rigs. So you've got about six running now. You're planning to bump up to 12. What's the plan as far as, you know, where those other six are going to go? Can you talk about the depth capacity of the rigs? And by the time you get to 12, isn't this one of the largest campaigns in Ecuador, if I'm not mistaken? At 12, we'll be at 12 rigs by the middle of the year. And it may, in fact, be the largest drill campaign in, in Latin America, period. So this is a this is a major program. These these kinds of programs you 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 seldom see ever in industry, but where you do, it's typically in Quebec or you know Ontario, maybe BC or Nevada or something where you can where you've got access to all this infrastructure and rigs, and you can bring them in and and then shuffle them out as as needed. But but this this may be the largest drill program in South America by the time we get it fully ramped up. But basically, you know, to understand our strategy in terms of uh, uh, the drill program, think of it in two parts. So the first part is just the resource drilling that we're doing. And so this is taking uh, basically 40, the 40,000 meter drill budget that we, that we previously announced and then applying that to a roughly one kilometer section of strike length, uh, which we call of, of this uh, sulfide porphyry system, which we call Warinza Central. And then over the first half of the year, drilling, so applying that 40,000 meters to that roughly one kilometer long strike length, drilling it down to one kilometer depth. And that volume uh, that we're talking about encompasses something like 1.4 billion tons of rock. And then the eventual resource that comes out of that resource drilling program will be whatever subset of that 1.4 billion tons is mineralized above a cutoff grade and fits in a pit shell. So, so that'll be the, the resource. And then I'll, I'll talk about the other program, but let me first put that part in perspective so you understand how that kind of drilling would fit into what you would look at when you look across the, the, the spectrum of projects in the industry. The very best, probably the best uh, copper project period, but certainly the very best open pit copper project at the moment in the development stage would be Anglo-Americans Quileveco project in Peru. And this has a reserve inventory of 1.3 billion tons at 0.57% copper equivalent. Okay, 1.3 billion tons at 0.57 copper equivalent. Uh, that's Coelho Veco. So, something like Tex, you know, should be more, more um, you know, North American investors would be more familiar with Tex QB2 project in Chile. That would be about 1.4 billion tons at 0.48% copper equivalent. And these are both true mega projects, you know, plus 5 billion capex with, you know, the infrastructure issues, high elevation, no fresh water, et cetera. Okay. Those are the very best. That's as good as it gets so that you understand. And, and we're drilling off a, a comparable sort of volume of rock just in the central zone, just with our resource drilling program. And that, and that drilling will be done certainly by the end of the second quarter, you know, with the expectation that a resource would follow in three or four months um, from that point. So that's 40,000 meters of drilling, okay? And we'd completed about 14,000 meters of that drilling up to the end of the year, okay? But we have a program going from six rigs to 12 rigs where we're gonna drill over 120,000 meters this year. So, that, so there's more than 90,000 meters that is gonna be directed to the rest of the porphyry systems that we can now see. And I think we're clear for anyone to see in the 3D geophysics uh, that we released in February. So in a press, if I'd encourage everyone to look at the press release um, because we cut some some images for that release. That was uh, February 16th, I believe. And um, but you can also visit SolarisResources.com. Uh, right on our homepage, on the right hand side, there's a, a 3D model where you can load up all of our drilling results, the historical drilling results. Uh, the geochemistry and the geophysics in three dimensions and spin it around and have a look at it and take in the scale of the opportunity um, that we that we have here with this uh, with this Warenza project. Um, and so we've got over 90,000 meters of drilling that's going to be directed to the rest of 
uh, the system here. And so this would be drilling between um, Marinsa Central to the west, uh, towards Marinsa West. And in our last release, you know, we announced um, some drill holes that stepped out to the uh, the west. This was in the release that was dated February 22, and and basically two step out holes to the west, both of which cut long intervals from surface of 1% copper equivalent. So very high grade mineralization right from surface as we step out to the west. And there's a further at least kilometer out to the west that we can continue to step out and would hope to add to this inventory of very high grade uh, copper mineralization that we find on the western side of, of, of Warrensa Central and the western extension. So drilling in that location, doing the, doing the opposite, so going out to the east, this uh, sulfide system, which is evident in the 3D geophysics, is, has roughly a three and a half kilometer long strike length. So as you go from west through central to east, three and a half kilometers, and you're talking about a total volume of rock, total volume which encompasses something like 10 billion tons of, of high conductivity, high sulfide rock that we need to go in and drill test. And this is where this is another this is another area where we're going to be directing a considerable amount of drilling, and then the and then the final area which we're going to get to in the second quarter. So and this is I'm speaking only about the first half of the year. Is is Warinza South, and this is a separate porphyry system. It's located about four kilometers to the south of uh, Warinza Central, Warinza East, and um and and this was a major revelation coming out of the geophysical. Uh, survey because what we found is that our understanding of the target size there, which was based on just the surface geochemistry, there had been no 3D work. Obviously, there's no drilling anywhere outside of Central. Our understanding of the scale of the system was that it would be similar to Central, roughly a kilometer by a kilometer or so, potentially uh, you know billion billion and a half uh, ton target size there. Uh, but what we realized with the 3D geophysics is that the geochemical anomaly, the geochemistry at surface was just reflecting the portion of the sulfide system that came close to surface. And then in fact, that's almost something like the tip of the iceberg because the bulk of the system is actually is sitting at depth there. So that we're into self target, the volume of high conductive rock, which is high sulfide rock, which corresponds to high grades that were in central. That's a 5 billion ton volume. That we're going to go drill. So that could be a major discovery in its own right. So that's the drilling. So it's 40,000 meters uh, into resource drilling, 90,000 meters into this discovery and growth oriented drilling that we're going to be doing this year. Lots of info, Dan. Lots of stuff there. And my guess is you're robbing some uh, rigs from Luminex while you're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> So with the uh, with the results that you guys have, so you're heading to the south project. You know, this is all within a very small radius. The whole area is just you know Correct. not much distance here at all, which is fantastic. With the samples and geophysics, uh, any other targets, any sequence that you're going to go after here? The uh, El Trinche area is that of any use here? What about some of the gold targets? What's the sequence here? Yeah, great question. So, so to be clear, on, on the geophysics, we put out the, the 3D imagery just for the Rinsa porphyry cluster as we know it today. So it's basically a five kilometer by five kilometer area. The targets that we had identified, which we viewed at the time as individual porphyry centers um, based on the surface geochemistry that we collected were Rinsa Central, um, Rinsa West, where we've now made a discovery, Rinsa East, which we'll drill in, in Q2, and then we're in the south, which will drill late in Q2. Okay, and the, and those were those were basically the targets based on the, the 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 surface geochemistry. With the 3D geophysics, so we're now able to look at the subsurface and identify the extent of the sulfide systems. We can see that actually everything from Rinsa west through central to east is just one is just one sulfide system. Okay, and then Rinsa south is a separate system. Now we did find a new target uh, called Yowie. Which, which has a very limited uh, to almost no surface expression in terms of geochemistry. It's um, possibly a deeper target uh, based on the geophysics. And so you don't have the, the sulfide system coming up to surface and generating a, 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 ge a geochemical anomaly. Um, but that may just be because we've, we've only interpreted 
half of the of the uh, target there. So we've just basically done the 3D inversions over that five by five kilometer area, and and Yowie's lying, which was a new discovery, is lying just on the edge of that. Um, and so we'll process of the full data set covering the the full property package. It's going to take us additional time, but certainly when we do that, I'd be surprised if we don't turn up additional new targets like Yowie. And these have these have the potential to be very significant in terms of scale. Something like Yaoi, uh, which again is cut off by the edge of the interpretation of the data, and may may in fact be larger. Um, something like Yaoi is is you know over a two billion ton target. So these are large scale. You know this is a very very fertile belt, obviously. And then this this area in particular around Warinza seems to be particularly prolific. Um, so I'd be surprised if we didn't turn up additional targets in terms of the porphyries, the copper porphyries. Now on the gold side, we've, we've got a series of, of three large scale gold anomalies. The largest of the gold anomalies is called Kaya. It's the southern target and it's roughly a four by four kilometer area um, of, of gold geochemistry where we've got you know, values consistently over half a gram per ton uh, of gold just in, in soils across this broad area. And then in fact, in, in, in more detailed sampling that we've done, we've, we've now overlaid um, a copper anomaly on the Southern part of that gold anomaly. Um, so there's more work that needs to be done here. Obviously we haven't gotten to the geophysics yet. We will in time. Um, I think between all those layers of data, we'll define a good drill target there. And that's something that we look forward to getting in and drilling alongside these other targets like Yaoi and the other ones that'll be generated by the geophysical survey in the second half of the year. Yeah, lots of stuff going on here. How about the PEA? When you guys get to this, maybe 2022, something like that. What's your thoughts on timeline there? You mentioned resource updates potentially uh, later in the year, Q3, Q4 type setup. And what price for copper? is anticipated for the initial pit design when you guys start working on that. What's your thoughts on what you might use for copper price? We've got to be mindful of what the norms are in industry so that when we present our numbers, they're on an apples to you know, investors can compare them on an apples to apples basis with, uh, you know, numbers from other companies in the industry so that it's a level playing field, if you will. Um, so, um, so it's not about our forecast for copper. I, I personally believe that the base for copper going forward is four dollars a pound, and so perhaps there's you know a technical correction that takes us below that level, you know, in the short term. But I think over the balance of this decade, four dollars is going to prove to be the base uh, for copper. But that doesn't mean that we go and publish our resource estimates and mine plans, you know, in in, in engineering and economic studies PAs, PFS, FS down the line. At, at four dollars a pound, we've still got to present everything on a basis which is digestible and understandable and comparable for investors uh, to what to to other projects in the industry. So currently, the base price for evaluation of copper project is three dollars, but but obviously, I think in in the future that's going to be headed higher. So I, I know one of the brokers which covers our stock has gone to three fifteen, and another is at. 350. And so I think you'll see that industry, you know, so as these estimates move higher, I think you'll see that industry responds by moving their base, you know, uh, economic assumptions higher as well. So we'll see how that plays out. Nothing is set in stone for us at the moment. $3 is reasonable here. Given the project quality, I don't think that's any issue. And, yeah. you know, we'll see what the market gives us. And well, right. Well, we're in isn't a project. I mean, like we're in isn't a project that requires high prices. I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you, if you think about like copper projects at large scale, open pit settings, cutoff grades now are, are anywhere from 0.1% copper to 0.15. Um, so that would be break even on an operating basis. And then the average development project now would be in the range of about 0.4. And so with our existing, the 2019 resource that we have at Warinza Central, that's at 0.7% copper equivalent. So whether you assume, I mean, $3 is a, is a gift. You could look at this project at $2 copper and you'd still have a robust project, I think. So yes. look, price isn't price isn't um, isn't the key for this project. It's a nice to have, not a must have. If you want to think of it that way. Yeah, absolutely. 
Talk about the PEA, what you think your timeline is. Do you guys see that you might uh, look at something being done in 2022? Oh yeah, no, no, no question about that. We we hired uh, so so basically all of the various technical threads that would go into supporting and coming together in an engineering and economic study like a PEA. Those have already started, so we have the contractors already at work, or at least doing gap analysis in advance of the work uh, to get all of those things moving forward. And basically, this is all this is all happening now under the direction of Chad Woolahan, who we hired from Ivanhoe Mines as our VP projects. And Chad at Ivanhoe Mines uh, did all the put in place the basic technical programs that supported uh, their flagship project, Kamoa Kakula, which is one of the great copper projects of the world, uh, going from and great copper discoveries of all time, uh, going from uh, going th going going through PEA uh, feasibility study into detailed engineering, and now of course that project is transitioning beautifully into pre-production. And, the, and then eventually production. And so, and Chad led those programs at Ivanhoe Mines. So we hired Chad as our VP projects to do, uh, to basically do the same job for us uh, with our Warinsa project. And, and Warinsa is a vastly um, less complicated project than, than something like Kamoa, which is a true underground prototype, only one of its kind ex exercise in engineering excellence. <laughs> Whereas Warinsa is, you know, a vanilla, a uh, very straightforward project with all the infrastructure that it has, open pit, high grades, right from surface, low strip ratio, et cetera. It's a, it's a walk in the park for someone like Chad Wollahan. And so that's already started. Um, th those, those programs will progress throughout the year. We should be in shape, We're absolutely a PEA in, in 22, probably close in the first half of the year. Dan, how about the geotechnical team? Have they had any issues have come up with the, the drill results, the materials coming out of these holes? Any issue with metallurgy here? Any contaminant materials? Any word from the geotechnical team as far as uh, their satisfaction? <laughs> On the metallurgy, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that first. So that work, the detailed work is just getting underway now, but there are no deleterious elements. So if you look at the assay sheets, there is no arsenic, there's no mercury, there's there's nothing here. And that's just a reflection of the mineralogy. You know, what we're looking at, and this is very unusual when you're talking about porphyry deposits. When you look at high grade copper projects, typically the highest grades, uh, which make an outsized contribution to the overall grade, are coming from a high sulfidation overprint uh, or a SCARN uh, overprint or SCARN zone. And that, that introduces all of these deleterious elements alongside the higher kind of copper values, presents all sorts of issues around, you know, uh, mining and, uh, and uh, resource estimation because you require capping and all that sort of stuff. So you see that in some of the comp set, if you were to look at our peers, where they're taking, you know, these narrow intervals of, of high grade copper with all these nasties in it, and then they're spreading it out and smearing it out back to surface to create a long interval of apparently high grade, but it's not really representative. And then that stands in, in, in stark contrast to what we have at Warinza. Warinza is a pure porphyry system. We do not have any high grade subintervals that we're smearing out. There is no high sulfidation overprint. There is no scarn. And so we don't have all of any of these nasty uh, elements um, at work in the um, mineralogy of our project. So it's very clean. It's going to be very clean from a metallurgical standpoint, very high recoveries in the historical testing that was done. So this is over 90% for copper and gold. And then the moly values, which are, are still to be tested, these are, you're starting from a very high grade uh, point, you know. So, so this, in our 2019 resource estimate, the moly grade on average was, 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 uh, was 300 ppm. Now, high moly copper moly porphyries globally. So your type examples here would be, you know, Sierra Gorda or Sarita, Tocopala, uh, et cetera. Uh, even Pebble in Alaska would be a good example. Those are generally running 150 or 200 ppm moly. So here we're talking about 50% higher moly grades. And, and, you know, and there's, uh, if, if not linear, there's certainly a strong positive correlation between grade and recovery. So we're expecting excellent recoveries on Molly as well. So over 90 on copper, over 90 on gold, and we'd uh, love to see over 90 on the Molly as well. 
Um, the geotechno program is, is just getting underway, so we've got to do more rigorous testing. But if you just look at the drill core coming out of the ground, it's in very good shape. So this is not a core that's busted up and faulted and jointed uh, with you know zones of, of, of fault gouge and clays and things like that that could present geotechnical issues into the future. This is very solid core. Um, so I have no doubt that uh, we're going to we're going to have good quality rock here, all the, well certainly at Warrensa Central and then good steep uh, pit slopes as well. What do you think will be the main challenges for the project feasibility, given the potential size and scale of the project? And would you say that Mirador and Fruta del Norte, not far away, have really just done a good job of a good portion of the heavy lifting for Warrensa to have really an increased chance of really full success here? I think Fruta del Norte has done a great job in showing the way of environmentally responsible and socially inclusive development. And so that it's a very clear cut example of how mining can benefit remote communities, benefit you know, local, regional, and the federal government with its development and economic activity. Um, so I think that one's really clear cut. I think Mirador has got more of a mixed history because it was it was basically taken on by a Chinese or implemented by a Chinese joint venture with a very different understanding of uh, <laughs> of CSR and uh, and the imperative of that responsible approach. And so they didn't ingratiate themselves um, to anything like the same degree with the local population as, as Lundin Gold with their project strategy. Yeah, I would say it's really Lundin Gold that, uh, that laid the groundwork for us to come in and have a positive reception um, from the get-go, which allowed us to then uh, restore the social license and get our project underway. That was really lending gold with Fruit del Norte more than it was Mirador. In terms of the infrastructure, the infrastructure was already there. So Fruit del Norte and Mirador both benefited from the same high, highway network. You know, we're approximately uh, uh, 40 kilometers, 45 kilometers up the highway from Mirador. So that's the same highway and that connects out to the Pacific ports. So that's your, you know, your, your main logistical network, obviously. And then likewise with the power grid, the power grid was already there. So it was just a matter of putting in a substation and then the connection to the power grid. And we've got access to that as well. And in Ecuador, you know, there's the added benefit that this is like cheap, clean uh, hydroelectric power. So renewable power. This will be important in terms of the, you know, emissions uh, that the project, you know, it's, it's full scale emissions, not just the direct, you know, emissions out of the project, but, but also the power supply into the project. Um, so, so renewable, you know, renewable power, and then of course the fresh water, which is just a massive advantage relative to the, you know, main copper producing regions in Chile and Peru, which are very dry and water, fresh water has become a real point of, of political, for, you know, socio-political friction. So we have abundant fresh water as well. So those, those natural advantages were already there. I wouldn't say that those projects have, have kind of laid the physical infrastructure in place that we're going to take advantage of. I, I think it was already there. It's good that you guys are embedded in a region that's that's pretty sound, and you know, hopefully Mirador can mimic a little bit of what Lundin's doing and keep up the uh, the community side. And, and it's going to be these projects together a, a big windfall for the local community, the region, and for the country. And so I think that's important. And you hit really well on the water. Fantastic setup with water. What's the elevation up there, Dan? The highest elevations that we're looking at are about 1,800 meters above sea level. So that's low elevation relative, you know, in the global context for copper projects. There's no issue on elevation at all. The, the topography in some areas of our project is quite challenging for exploration in the rainy season. So in the because it's, you know, you basically got all this clay alteration everywhere. And then in the rainy season, water plus clay is a pretty slippery slope where you've got topography. So that presents a challenge in terms of putting in place all of our trails, maintaining trails, putting in place our, our drilling platforms and so on in the exploration stage during the rainy season. You know, so in the dry season, it's no issue. But as the project advances into development and eventually in a production scenario, that topography is going to be a benefit for you because you're going to have, you know, now with the, the modern mining fleets are all at least hybrid and they're headed towards full electrification terms of the rolling fleet. That topography where you've got positive topographic relief between where you're mining and then where your mill uh, is located means that you get a gravity assist on your haul. 
And so you're actually generating electricity, which, which has an important impact in terms of lowering your, your mining cost and your haul cost. So we think that the topography is actually going to be an advantage for us, even if in the short term it's, you know, like in the height of the rainy season in March, it's been a bit of a challenge. Well, let's look out two years. At what stage do you want this project in two years, Dan? And what is your plan to get there? Yeah, I think, you know, so our, our strategy from the beginning has been that we're going to sell this project, okay? And so we're not going to be the ones developing this project. And so the strategy was was very clear in terms of what we needed to do to sell this project. It, of course, the most important thing, you know, to provide for uh, the execution of the drilling and technical programs and so on, the important CSR programs, was the funding. And so we've fully funded now this company through to what we anticipate will eventually be the point of sale. We've got over $90 million Canadian, uh, translates in real dollars to about $70 million on the balance sheet. We only anticipate spending 30 to $35 million. So we're more than fully funded before we even get into the warrants. Um, and then we've got to do the, the resource drilling, which is really the easy part. The hard part was the discovery and getting a hold of a world-class project in the first place. That was done for us. The easy part is just drilling it out at Warinsa Central. You know, that's the 40,000 meter drill program that I talked about. We're just taking on basically a one kilometer stretch of this three and a half kilometer long porphyry body um, from Warinsa West through Central to East. We're taking the central kilometer or so of that at Warinsa Central, and we're gonna drill it out to an indicated category of resource, uh, or largely an indicated category of resource. So this will be, these are, this is a higher confidence category of resources than inferred resources. Uh, you know, indicated you can have confidence on that the resources uh, are there to a much greater degree than inferred. Some of these inferred resources are, are unreliable. We'll drill it out to indicated, and we think that are largely indicated. And then we'll, uh, and then we'll complete an engineering and economic study. This is the work that Chad Wollohan is, is um, embarking on right now. And we think that that alone, we're into central alone, before you get to West, where we just announced a discovery, East, which we'll be doing discovery drilling in the second quarter, South, which we'll be doing discovery drilling later in the second quarter, and these other targets around this. Um, before we get to any of that stuff, we think we have the potential to have possibly the best copper project in the development stage on the board, i.e. independently held. And again, the, the reference point, the very best project out there is Anglo's Qualiveco project. That's 1.3 billion tons at 0.57. Tex Cobrata Blanca 2 is 1.4 billion tons at 0.48. So that's your reference point. And we think we can get in amongst that sort of bracket with Lorenzo Central. And if we can do that, we think we have a project that we can sell just on that basis. And so that brings us into you know 2022. There's just so much potential just outside of what you guys haven't even started to include in the economic studies, which is these satellite deposits all within a mineable radius. And so Hopefully, hopefully you don't get rid of it too too early, Dan. <laughs> well, no, you, you know, look. Fortunately, it's uh, you know shareholders can count on on Richard Bork's experience here. You know, so it's not about Dan Earl; it's about Richard Bork. And Richard, uh, I don't think anyone's done a better job than Richard at uh, at knowing when to transact on on projects than he has. He's got over, you know, the Augusta Group has got over four and a half billion dollars of exit transactions under its belt the last 10 years. And so if there's anyone who's well positioned uh, for strategic discussions and strategy, it's Richard Mark, our executive chairman. And not a coincidence, he's the major shareholder of this company. Not a coincidence. Yeah, that's good. Well, I wanna move on here as we start to wrap up here. Appreciate the time. Um, I want to talk about La Verde in a moment, but uh, can you give us a status update on the other projects? Uh, any plans for drill programs this year, and also including the Freeport earn in at Ricardo, Chile? We've got our uh, joint venture meeting coming up with them. This, this, for people who aren't familiar with with Ricardo, this is basically a project. It's well understood that that half of the Chuki come out of deposit. And this is one of the world's great copper deposits, one of the largest, highest grade copper deposits in the history of, of the industry at Chuki Kamado. And it's well understood that half of that deposit, it's faulted off. So half of the deposit is still to be located. And David Lowell theorized that that was uh, potentially offset down to the south. So he's so so we have the land package to the south, a very large land package contiguous to Chuki Kamado to the south. 
exploring this proved very difficult for David Lull in a predecessor company because it's you're looking for deep targets. They're narrow in terms of their lateral width, but then they have great vertical extent and strike extent. So it's like uh, it's it's technically complex, deep drilling, expensive drilling. And, and David wasn't able to successfully test his targets in a predecessor company. So this is now uh, in our company, it's been joint venture to Freeport. Freeport has very deep pockets. They're very excited about the project. They've been doing some very sophisticated uh, geophysical work to set up a very aggressive drill program, which will be underway this year. We'll get the update on that in the next month or so, and then we'll share that that news with, uh, with shareholders at the appropriate time. But that's elephant country. There's true mega project discovery potential on, on that project, but it's best the work is best done by uh, a deep pocketed company like Freeport. Um, so that's ongoing. We have a, a series of projects which we call Tamarugo, also in, in Chile. Uh, this is one of um, one of a portfolio of grassroots exploration projects that were put together by David Lowell. These were David Lowell's targets for future discoveries. Um, and so the Tamarugo project and the neighboring projects in Chile, which we don't even talk about, uh, we're, 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 will be one of the tests uh, for a new discovery. And then also we've got two projects in, in Peru uh, called Capriccio and Paco Orco. These we just had um, our latest uh, meeting on, on just on Friday, actually, um, talking about the community engagement and, uh, and CSR work that we're doing there, which is a, which um, for our company, uh, has to be done to our satisfaction before we try and advance the project to drilling. So we want to have a concrete uh, social license and under clear consensus and understanding with local communities on uh, what we're going to do, what the impacts are, what the potential benefits are, and commitment for the exploration activity to take place. So, um, so when that's in place, then we'll get in there and drill those projects as well. Though that's true. Those are, again, uh, David Bull's targets for future discoveries. In the case of Capriccio, you have a porphyry right at surface that's never been drilled with good values uh, that was exposed in a, in a recent landslide. So that's an exciting target as well. Lots of pipeline projects here and uh, a lot of potential even outside of the core project, which is shaping up to be impressive as well. Yeah. So La Verde. Yeah. Is this a monetization asset, Dan, if, you know, Solaris continues to grow from here on the Warrenza success? You know, there's a lot of room on that for the market cap alone. Would Tech and Solaris jointly advance this project in the future, potentially develop? Is there any intention of becoming a producer or is this just sold off? I, yeah, I, I think this is something that, that's, you know, totally unappreciated by the market, which just sits in our, our portfolio in, in the background. I, th I think if we had this in a standalone company within our group, this would have, you know, several hundred million dollar valuation just on its own, but it's totally lost and overshadowed by uh, a project like Warenza with the stunning results that come out of that project. But but this is to, to to give your listeners an idea. This is 740 million tons of copper resources with in open pit copper resources with an average grade of about 0.4 percent copper equivalent. Okay, so that's an av that's a uh, average grade and better than average size copper project in Mexico, uh, right on the highway, uh, power lines coming through the project site, there's water available, um, it's close to the Pacific port. So it's a, it's a true, it's, it's a robust development opportunity. For us, the way that we look at it is, is this is the kind of project that you wanna hold on for when the new baseline, the new reference price, the new uh, long-term assumption in valuing copper projects is $4 and above because that's when a project like this really shines. You know, this is a project to a much greater degree than something like Warenza that really benefits from higher copper prices. And so we're happy to hold on to this project um, and do community work and just maintain uh, social support for the project for when the market reaches the right point where you bring a project like this to the fore, either by monetizing it, which we're open to, um, if it if it's the if it's uh, the balance of risk reward for our shareholders um, favors that, then we'll do that. We have no problem doing that. Or it may be something that ends up in a spin out company, and our shareholders can benefit from that down the line if we sell Marinza first. So we're open to all things. Uh, we're flexible, but remember, we're the largest shareholders of this company, and so we're going to do what's right for shareholders. 
this is uh, shined a lot more since you and I last spoke. So important little back ace in the pocket, if you will. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, and, we, and, we, and we've had people approach us about, you know, about whether be, we'd be willing to dispose of this asset. You know, it, it didn't, with a sub $4 copper price, that you don't even entertain that conversation. But, um, right. but at some point in the future, it'll, it'll begin to make sense. Yeah, maybe they'll come hat in hand as the prices move higher. Dan, besides Solaris, there's a few other Explore Devcos out there in the copper gold types that are in Ecuador specifically. I can think of a few. Mm -hmm. Are there mm -hmm. any companies that stand out to you or any that you're monitoring closely within Ecuador? I mean, there are a lot of great projects like Sol Gold at the top of the list just has one of the best copper projects there is. It's, um, uh, you know, nearly a three billion ton high grade uh, underground uh, development opportunity in northern Ecuador. And so that's, you know, I, I mean, on, in an industry context, so a global context, not never mind just an Ecuador one, that's kind of uh, uh, um, a, a real standout. Um, so certainly um, that bears bears uh bears watching closely because it could it's it, it the two of the senior producers um uh with particular skills that are relevant to this kind of a development opportunity bhp and newcrest both have stakes in that company so that's one to watch you know for for m a going forward um another one would be would be lumina gold so this isn't a uh like strictly speaking a, a copper project but um but this is this is a copper gold project open pit opportunity uh with their with their flagship can greg joe's project and this is it probably doesn't receive as much market attention as it truly deserves um because you know ross Beatty, obviously his following is focused on the good work that he's doing at uh, at equinox and it's more advanced than than luminex which is which is in and it pro probably sp splits the limelight with, with luminex which is focused on exploration but, the, but this is a robust uh, development opportunity in, in southern Ecuador and post PEA. So this this may stand to participate in the M&A cycle for Ecuador when it gets going again, which may be after the election is resolved in April. So so I would certainly focus on Lumina. For people who haven't looked at Lumina Gold, I would absolutely have a look at Lumina Gold. Yeah, likewise. We're also there as well. And, and Luminex is one that we do like for potential uh, smaller company. Oh. Um, exploration. Big, uh, yeah, definitely good on that front. And Lumina, big project there and fantastic asset in my view, but a lot of people in the market don't seem to share that view. Well, look, the company stands today, Dan, at around 730 million Canadian market cap here. What do you say to potential investors who are listening? Why should they get involved now? And how are you going to keep this momentum going really just on a near perfect execution thus far? Oh sure. I mean, for 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 people that are um, that are trying to make sense of that valuation, I mean, you 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 need to keep in mind what the um, what even the 2019 resource would translate into in terms of project economics. So, and the best reference, if you can't if you're not equipped to do the work yourself, is to just look at the published research on the company. So it's a relatively new company. We don't have a great depth of uh, published research on us, but we do have some firms like uh, Eight Capital, for example. Um, in Toronto, TD Securities in Toronto, Hanneman Partners out of London. And, and each of these firms has published economics. In fact, the valuation basis for our company is based on the economics of the 2019 resource estimate. And, and that 2019 resource estimate was 124 million tons, basically seven kilometers of drilling um, just around the discovery outcrop to 200 meters depth. So 124 million tons in a pit shell, um, 2019 resource estimate. And and Aid Capital, they're sitting at about $970 million of net asset value. Hanneman Partners is $650 million of net asset value. The, the difference there is the copper price. And TD is about $760 million of net asset value just on that 124 million tons, okay, based on seven kilometers of drilling. Now we've demonstrated multiple times growth potential. We've got intercepts that are down over a kilometer with the same kinds of grades uh, in the drilling that we've demonstrated. We're gonna allocate 40,000 meters of drilling to the next resource update for Warrensa Central. So you've got to um, consider the growth potential in those uh, valuation estimates as we grow our resources in, in the next update. But, but the valuation where we currently trade today, I think is fully justified just on the basis of the existing resource. 
it doesn't begin to account for uh, the next resource update, let alone the discovery potential beyond that, the rest of the projects, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's great, Dan. And we've got to add some staff here and get with our uh, analyst coverage as well. The company haven't done that yet. Apologies, but we'll get to it. Uh, best way for the investors to get in touch with you and the company here? As I say, solarisresources.com. If you have not been to our website, we've got a great depth of information available in respect of the drilling that we're doing, all of the results, the historical results, uh, the geophysics, which speak to the scale of the discovery potential and growth potential on Aritza, that's all available in a three-dimensional model that you can manipulate, zoom in, zoom out, spin around, look at it upside down from the bottom, whatever you want. That's all available on our website, in addition to very extensive information on uh, CSR and ESG. So I think we've probably done more in terms of ESG reporting than any company in the exploration and development stage. Our reporting, in fact, I think is in advance of most of the producing stage companies out there. All of that wealth of information is available on our website. And then please reach out to management. If you want to talk in more detail, uh, we make um, every, every effort. It's part of our strategy to be responsive and accessible to uh, existing investors and potential new investors. And so you can find me on Twitter as well. Daniel Earl 3 is my address on Twitter uh, or through our website. You can get in touch as well. Well, let's cut it there. Really appreciate the update on Solaris and uh, keep up the good work to drive this company ahead. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time.